So welcome, Mishka. If you don't know, Mishka is a producer in Rovio and also founder of Deconstruction of Fun. And we are very happy to have you here once Thank you. again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, so this is my second time here. And um, in, in Finnish culture, usually if you ask to do something again, it's a bad sign. So I don't know if this is a good thing that I'm presenting again or not, if they just, but I um, hope it is, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So in my presentation, I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, key trends in mobile. Um, and yeah, a little bit more about myself. So I have two names and three jobs. Uh, so in, in terms of names, uh, the official is Mihal Katkov, but everybody calls me Mishka. And um, I'm a head of studio at Rovio. Uh, I founded a site called Deconstructor of Fun about eight years ago, still running quite strong and growing. And um, I'm also um, a venture partner at a, at a seed fund. So yeah, but enough about me. And let's talk about this presentation. So this is made from my, from my perspective uh, as a head of studio. And uh, what I mean by that is as a head of studio, you, you have, when you're making a game, you basically look at three things. So you start off with what do we want to build. And of course, if this is the only thing you want to do, then you're going to make games with space orcs and, and space marines and, and spaceships. Uh, but the second part that is equally important is understanding what your team can build. And oftentimes, made the mistakes myself as well, is you're trying to build something that you actually can't build. And um, yeah, you don't want to be there. But the final element uh, that this presentation is going to concentrate on is what does the market want? Because even though if you are able to build something and you're really excited about building what you're building, uh, if that's the wrong thing, it's just not going to succeed. And that's a wasted effort. So we're going to talk about you know, the, the middle point here and, um, and not ending here as, um, as well. As, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what it means when you end there. <laughs> All right, so there's going to be a lot of data in this presentation. So whether you use Sensor Tower, Game Refinery, App Annie, the data is from all, all over the place. So blame me, don't blame, uh, blame them, don't blame me. <laughs> or either or. <laughs> but the but most important thing is as you see all the data, as you see the revenue numbers, as you see the installs, just take them with a grain of salt because they come from third party data platforms. All right, let's get started. So we are in a very mature place in terms of where the industry is at the moment. And it kind of means three things. Well, first of all, it means that the, uh, the installs are going down. The growth rate of installs is going down. But at the same time, what it means is the spend on mobile games is going up. And also what it means is that the time spent playing games is just skyrocketing all the time. And even if we look at the, um, how games are doing compared to other apps, you know, we're pretty much crushing it. And it kind of leads to a situation where we could say, well, yes, the mobile market is growing, it continues to grow, everything is great. But let's analyze the growth a little bit more. And, and in that sense, we can see that the amount of games have really stabilized on the, on the market. And this is just because the amount of games entering the market since 2016 has plummeted. So it's, it's hard to get a game out. And the, but, but when you think about the top, you, you have to think about it in a different way, and it's actually getting wider. So 65% of all the revenue is still, this is enough purchase revenue, is still uh, going to the top 100. But if you consider it overall, like let's say games that make over 5 million annually, even a little bit over or a lot over, that number has grown and is growing quite significantly every year. And the top is not only getting wider, it's also evolving. So when you will look at the absolute peak of the peaks, the, uh, the top 50 game, 50% um, of them have changed since 2017. And even though it's very hard to get to the top and takes a long time, well, on average and, and actually on median as well, it takes about nine months for a game to launch and reach the top 100 grossing. And there's often talk that it's impossible to reach it, it's, you know, out of our scope and this and that, but actually 28 games have entered the top 100 during the last year. So that's, you know, 20%. And when we talk about the top of the top, the peak of the peak, the, I know, the games, we often think about it as, as this. But actually, this is what the top looks like. It's hard to get there, but it's a little bit more even than we think. Now, um, 
Finally, I think there's one we want to think about top developers and top companies, and I'm sure everybody here wants to be among the best. Uh, this is my personal opinion, but I think it takes four, four elements, four ingredients to be on the top and stay on the top. Uh, first of all, of course, you have to have the resources to scale up your user acquisition. Making a game is easier now than it was five years ago. It's easier now than it was 10 years ago. Scaling a game is the true entry barrier. Um, so I don't think that's, a, that's contested. Uh, but the second most important part is you have to have strong live operations. So just getting the game up uh, on the top is not enough. You have to actually stick there. You have to be coming up with great content, exclusive content, interesting content. I'm looking at the Call of Duty guys because I love that game. Uh, and, um, and that allows you to stay on the top and, and really create that forever franchise. Third important element for a successful company, in my opinion, is a diversified portfolio. Uh, it's really, you know, it, it, it kind of, often we talk about just doing games for the same audience because you know that audience and you're catering to them and you're kind of exploring more and more. But in the case of Glue, uh, during the last year we saw what happened when Playrix and, and um, Applovin went to war with, with creatives. They were the ones that took in the collateral damage. And there's also big changes happening in market. Games like Call of Duty launch, and they you know, switched the, uh, the quarter for everybody. So if you have a diversified portfolio, you're a little, bit, you know, a little bit shielded for that. But also, you have more opportunities for growth, because you're actually looking at, at different audiences at the same time. And finally, it's also important to focus. It's important to keep on doing what you're doing and, and making better at what you're doing and in creating that expertise and that genre mastery in, in what you are doing. So, all right, so everybody was asking us, oh, not everybody, a few of the people were asking if we're gonna see a lot of circles, you are, and there's gonna be a lot of circles and a lot of numbers, so get, let's get into them. Um, the way I look at the market, and, and I'm sure a lot of people do the same way, is break it down into four genres. And when we think about the genres, like casual, mid-core, casino, and sports. So we think about casual markets, about uh, about you know, 40% of all the net purchase revenue is quite significant. Uh, ad revenues, most of the downloads are coming here. There's a mid-core, which takes again majority of in-app purchase revenues. Year-on-year um, -year revenue growth is is very healthy, and some some amount of of installs. The casino is is the one that seems to be you know good at monetization and very small amount of installs. Uh, Trend is continuing to, to even lower the, uh, the amount of installs, probably getting to 1% at some point. And then finally, there's the sports. So definitely more installs than revenue and a quite small category, but has a potential for growth. But most importantly, when you look at the growth numbers of year in year for everything, you can see that all the, uh, all the genres are growing. But let's take a, a deeper look first at the casual. The way I, I break down the, uh, the casual category, I kind of break it down into different, the, the genre break it down to categories, and then further down, start breaking out the, um, the categories and subcategories, and basically looking at where's, you know, where's the growth happening. So here are some year on year revenue numbers, and in this presentation, I'm gonna mainly concentrate on the, uh, the arcade part, which has shoot 'em up games like Archeros, it has uh, platformers, idle games, and hyper casual games. So, overall, you know, this is the, the number one question for, for this audience, is like, how did I get the, uh, the ad revenue numbers? And I know in the previous presentation there was a very well sophisticated calculation, so let's see how I, how I you know, arrived. So, basically summing up all the top ten hyper-casual publishers, then divided by six to get the DAU, multiply by 0 0.5 to get the, uh, the daily revenue, then multiply by 30 for monthly, and then multiply by 1.5 to get the, uh, the subcategory revenue. So let me know if this formula works for you. If it doesn't, I'll update it, but this is, this is my formula, I'm, I'm transparent. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and let's, let's just start talking about hypercasual. So this is gonna be a, a focus of the first part of the presentation. Now, hypercasual party, it got started a little bit back, a few years back ago, and, and due to mainly three things. So, very low entry barriers, very low CPIs, and of course, ultra aggressive ad monetization. And I'll, I'm gonna use Voodoo as, as one of the key examples here, and I'm gonna refer to a lot of their data from 2018 because it makes a point for, for the coming year. So Voodoo was back uh, last year, the number one publisher of all. I think uh, they had third of all the installs in games, so you know, pretty good. And basically, 
the way they worked is that a lot of studios, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know, but a lot of studios, a lot of talented studios, and industry leading marketing, very good at, at ad monetization, and that brought them to scale. And we think about their games and what were their approach for making games, and a lot of hyper casual developers have the same thing is, well, you start off with design that is very tested, um, inspired by somebody else quite often. And when you look at the design pillars, of course, you start off first with a very straightforward gameplay, so you don't have to do any tutorials, uh, any kind of difficult design decision there. It's snackable, meaning that there's no entry barrier to start playing the game. You can, if you have 20 seconds, that's enough, just jump on in. They're skill-based, so your progression is not metagame progression. It's mainly how good you're playing, how many fails you make, and how fast you go forward. Watchable for IPM, and of course, innovative to some sense, because you want to differentiate yourself. The second important element with hyper-casual publishing has been that you ship fast and ship a lot. And you look at the amount of games um, Voodoo shipped in a few months, it's, it's quite staggering. Uh, so several games a month, about three to four to five. And of course, it won't work if you can't grow the game. And when you start growing the game, it's of course, the, the first element is the retention. It has to be high, early retention. We talked about that it can be low if the IPM is great, but normally when you're looking at it, it has to be a high retention. Then you go for the wide audience, and, and of course, the high IPM, the, the creative has to be there to, to attract audience, to lower your CPI. The cross promotion, just to increase your portfolio value, and then through that, allow you to bid a bit higher. And finally, the aggressive ad monetization. And by aggressive, I mean super aggressive. Anything you can do to get people to watch as many ads as possible, that's good. And if they don't want to watch an ad, just make them pay for it. So what that cost was basically everybody kind of jumped on on the bandwagon. Here's just a few examples. And of course, that led to this, uh, a red ocean. And when we look at the, uh, the market as, as a whole, from, from that perspective, 2018 to now, uh, a lot of things have changed. So just in a span of, of last three years, we can see the market shares shifting quite dramatically with different publishers. We see Cheetah Mobile uh, almost like evaporating. Um, you know, some of us know the reasons. Um, uh, then we see Ketchup being pretty good at one point and, and now um, quite a small player in the market. Wudu is actually, when we consider it, it was, you know, last year was the biggest one. It was impregnable. It was impossible to, to compete with it. It's actually third currently and uh, just behind, well, Lion Studios and just behind Good Jobs and, and Say Games, which didn't really exist even at, at, you know, probably a couple of years ago. And when we further analyze the portfolio of these games, what we can see is that the um, sustained ability to create hit games is not there. So even with the scale of Wudu, they came in in 2017, had three games in top 100, then to 12 games, and now down to five. We have Cheetah Mobile with five and going to one. We have uh, Ubis oh, Ketchup going from four to three to one. App Lovin is losing some. And then we have new companies like Good Job Games and Say Games that are now at the top of the uh, category, just coming literally out of nowhere. So not a lot of entry barriers, not a lot of barriers to scale either. And the second important part is looking at the growth, because one thing is that we could say that the growth is there, because this quarter and the last quarter were, were biggest in the absolute numbers of downloads. And while that is true, but when you start really comparing the growth rates of quarter over quarter or year over year, you can actually see that the year over year growth is, is declining quite fast with the double digit numbers. So, about uh, um, in the beginning of this year, so pretty much a year ago, we kind of made this prediction that um, the hyper casual party is over as we know it. And what we meant by this is not that the, that the industry is going to end. What we meant was, was this, that there's a new way of monetization coming in. So ad revenue is super important. But we're going to see more games that are actually including more in-app purchase revenues. And it's because of this. So the CPIs are increasing and, and the competition is tough. And when you think about the LTV, it's usually the retention plus monetization. But when you think about monetization, it's ads plus in-app purchases. And if you think about a hyper-casual game, so well, you've kind of done everything for your ads that you could do. If you're a top player, you're doing all the right things. So how do you further increase your monetization? Well, that's usually through in-app purchases. And that, that kind of led us to make the, um, the prediction that the depth of these games is going to increase a little bit. And with that depth, you're going to improve a little bit of your, of your retention because 
maybe the depth comes through the metagame and not through skill-based games. And because of that metagame, it also offers you an ability to actually get in-app purchases running. So back then, we didn't have an example of a game that does hybrid monetization. We just made an, um, a theoretical argument that this could be it. And then this game launched. So any takers of what this game could be? It launched in March, the two early soft launch, and just after a couple of months, uh, got pretty big. And these are in-app purchase revenues. Archero. Yes, exactly. So uh, we saw our chair launch, and it was actually pretty much what we theorized about. It's a game that is very heavy on in-app purchase, in purchase, as well as an ad monetization. And it's also a game that is scaled to, to basically any region. And when we think about Archero, or as we call it, the king of hybrid monetization, we see that they have the element from hyper-casual games. The, uh, the core is extremely accessible, and, and it's just easily testable. Uh, we can see that their market strategy is just out of the hyper-casual playbook, uh, down to search and engine optimization. And we can see that they have added the simplified meta gameplay. Yes, it's a very skill-based game still, but the simplified meta game is just enough to increase your retention and just enough to add that depth. And that depth can be acquired either by playing longer or watching more ads through that, or just paying a little bit through in-app purchases. So that still leads to the same argument that, that we did pretty much a year ago, that, that this will change the industry in, in a way that we'll see more and more of these games coming out. And there's, I'm sure plenty of you have seen already some of the, them come out, games that rely on hybrid monetization and games that are in development with this type of approach. And that kind of leads to, um, yeah, to a new interesting era in the, uh, in the arcade games. But talking about dichotomy. <laughs> So uh, dichotomy is a, I had to look this up myself, so don't worry about it. I know it you yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not native English, so it's a, so it's a division in, or contrast between two things that are represented as being opposed or entirely different. So because this is a dichotomy, we talk about hyper-casual first, so let's talk about the other spectrum. And we're talking about other spectrum because when people ask, like, what's going on in the mobile games industry, you can't say one thing, you have to say multiple things. And the true dichotomy comes out of the mid-core. And, and what's happening here is when we look at the mid-core uh, market, we can see that during the, uh, the last three years, the, the, uh, the installs have declined. And we, have, we see few, few massive spikes when launched. We see the PUBGs coming up. We see in the strategy category, the Brawl Stars really pushing up. And then that crazy game, the shooter category, that just launched just 100 million installs. And we see less games launching because of the continuous inc increase in CPIs as well as the production costs. Uh, the production costs are going up and up and up. It's more harder to make a, a, a proper mid-core game, and that leads to a few or big launches. But then when you look at the, uh, the revenue side, uh, despite decline in the few of the largest category, subcategories, you can still see that the, um, the, game, the new games like Battle Royale, and Brawl Stars, and, and Call of Duty, well, they're not monetizing as well. So we see these new entrants coming in and, and not really peaking on the, on the revenue charts. And, um, yeah, we see um, just few new games launched because of competitiveness. But when you break it down further into the categories and the subcategories, uh, you can start seeing you know few elements here. So of course the competitiveness is here. There's a lot of a lot of market segments where the concentration is very very um, condensated. Uh, but at the same time, you can see that a growth number is coming in and. Categories like the 4X games and the build and battles and, and turn-based turn RPGs, there's still a lot of growth in those categories. And today, I want to concentrate on the, uh, the action part and especially these large, large games. So in, in about like 2018, uh, there was a lot of talk about these console quality games coming in for mobile. And of course, you know, as a designer, we were not believing that because you, know, you have to have short sessions. There's Starbucks test is the, is the key test. If you can't play this game during your, while you're waiting for your Americano or latte, that's not good enough. Uh, you know, from, a, from a game lead perspective, we didn't see that the, uh, the monetization through cosmetics could be you know, anything you could scale up. It's just not enough, not enough in any ways. And, and even, even just these, these virtual joysticks and scale-based progression, that, will, that could never hold on players. And when we saw these games come out, like Knives Out and Rules of Survival and, and PUBG even at the, at the beginning, yeah, this is pretty much what we're expected to happen, so. 
So we were wrong. And um, so till date, I looked at the net revenue numbers and, and these big games like PUBG, Knives Out, Call of Duty, um, basically console quality games have generated 2.6 billion and top grossing countries are Japan, USA and China. And when we look at the downloads, 1.3 billion in downloads with, with countries like India and China and US leading the way. So global hits around the world. And still, we have to say that, that it's not impossible market to entry because the c c consumers or the players are not as loyal. Uh, and the loyalty is not there because these games are skill-based versus time-based progression. So no matter how much time you put in, um, at a certain point you start hitting the skill cap and you kind of feel that you're not making any progress and if you take a couple of days off, you get just smothered when you come back. The second element that is hampering some of these games is there's no meaningful social structure. Uh, you're not really playing with others. If you are playing these games with others, you're, you're truly enjoying them and that keeps you together. But but there's no, you know, the guilds in many games just don't provide any, any kind of value compared to the guilds in other mid-core games. And finally, the ARP DAO is quite low compared to, let's say, RPG games. So how do you enter this market then? Well, you know, how do you get the chicken dinner? Though, I mean, that's an American chicken. It's probably <laughs> Turkey and other countries. Yeah, it's a giant chicken. Uh, first of all, you have to launch big. And you know, a little while back, Apex Legends launched, and it, that, was, that was everything that people were talking about, 25 millions in, in, in one week, and it sounded crazy. And then this game came out and just said, like, hold my beer. And um, Call of Duty hitting 100 million installs in, in, in one week. That's just staggering. And just, I mean, that's launching big. The second important, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. The games that didn't launch big, we don't even talk about them. And here are just a couple of examples that, that quality-wise have everything that you need to, to, to be a big game or differentiated. The Callings, the Realm Royales, Fear of the Wolves, whatnot. They have very interesting gameplay and they have everything to succeed, but they didn't launch big. And they kind of, you know, vanished. The second important part with these games is you have to have meaningful differentiation. So when we look at the PUBG, you can, you can see that it's a re very realistic art style. The gameplay is a lot about sneaking, about hiding. It's, it's a little bit slower pace. The maps are large to, to cater to that gameplay. And it has first person shooter as well as third person shooter modes. If you look at Call of Duty, well you have their own IP. You have team-based tactical modern warfare, so it's a quite different gameplay. The maps are very compact and it's focusing on first person shooting. And then you have Fortnite, cartoony, a lot of arcade action, building, which doesn't exist in, in other games, and medium-sized maps, as well as focusing on that third-person element. And, okay, so that's number two. Number three is the use of influencers. Uh, Supercell is probably one of the best examples of using influencers on mobile. So back, th back in the days when they launched, soft-launched uh, Brawl Stars, you maybe remember that they started off with giant competition with some of the biggest influencers, as well as some of their developers. Um, then they got their own influencers pushing a lot of videos, uh, and those videos helped them to get 600,000 installs on iOS alone in Canada during the first month. And it's not only Supercell. Others are seeing the, the effect of the influencers, and Epic has, has been building uh, a platform for influencers to help them with their new store. And finally, it's building a community. It's really important in these games, in the sense that, well, Supercell, again, is a great example. It's putting a lot of videos, interacting with the players, using influencers in the community videos to kind of be the voice of the players. Uh, their game lead is really active in Twitter, posting all kind of different stuff, and, and that leads for their community to be active. They send them different images, they help to create new maps. Uh, you know, they feel that they're part of development of the game, and that builds a strong community. Apex Legends is actually as good of an example Though, you know, their, their community has gone on a few rants, but other than that, um, great example of, of community work. So that, that leads to the, uh, the dichotomy. So when people ask, like, what's going on in the mobile market? Well, we see everything going on in the mo mobile market. We see games uh, like these ones. They launch big. They go all in in the beginning. They differentiate really meaningfully. They employ influencers to grow. They build a devoted communities. They, they are mostly in-app purchase and subscription-based. And they pretty much flip the business case. They don't look at the, um, the LTVs in the same way and the CPIs. They don't look to scale. They look to create a game that becomes a franchise that the people play for years, and that's going to bring the end revenue. And then you have totally different type of games. You make them fast, you test them, then you scale or trash them. Uh, you do mainly proven design. You have no influencers. You have no communities. 
you are mostly doing ad revenue, and the business case is basically if the LTV is higher than CPI, you're good to go, and you're good to scale. So this is the dichotomy of the mobile market that, that I see in, in the short run is we do all kind of different things. There's no one thing, and there's many ways to succeed, and um, yeah, and the market is growing. So thank you. Any question before we move to the next session? Anything you want to ask? Damon. Out of the mid-core games that failed, why didn't they go big? Was it a marketing budget question? Is that the main thing, or is there other factors involved? I think all of them are different, but I think some of them is, is marketing challenge. Some, some of them is just um, being afraid to pull the trigger. You have to have a pretty large organization to afford that kind of a launch that, that some of these games are done. I'm not some of them. All of the big ones have done just gigantic launches. Um, and, and if you're a smaller developer, if you don't have that budget, I mean, it's basically like betting the farm on this game and not expecting to get the returns quite quickly. So I think that's that's the uh, that's the reason, and and it creates a huge um, scale barrier um, for for these big games. Any other question? Yeah, <laughs> of course. We can Always. just we can just chat, you know. <laughs> We had the whole bus ride, but yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> um, the other question is, why is hyper casual seemingly only coming out of uh, Europe as opposed to like the U.S.? There aren't too many U.S. studios that are at least successful, as I can tell, out of the U.S. Christian, <laughs> you're uh, <laughs> future star. Yeah, future star. <laughs> I mean. Christian, you want to answer this? I, I think it's, it's, it's just a trend that's been happening for a long time. I mean, if you look at the top charts, it's, it used to be all US. And it's been just changing over the last few years. And it's just the evolution, I think, the maturity of the marketplace. Yeah. Development, development cost probably plays a role as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And then, I think I think not not a lot of developers are, are so keen on, on making a hyper casual game. Um, no offense, I mean, but but like oftentimes when you start a studio, it's it's not the first thing that, that developers want to do. They usually have a different kind of dreams and that evolve, you know, space marines. So so that's that's kind of the starting point. And, and I think we're seeing like the orchestration of these games uh, being produced out of the U.S. Uh, a lot of them are being developed overseas. Yeah. Um, and the, these developers are all over the world. Yeah. Small. Anyone else? Maybe Damon. <laughs> Damon? Nothing? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Guy. It was super interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you.